Service of Missions Conference. Good to see you here tonight. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. We've been looking forward to this for quite a while, I think since January, uh, when I first spoke to Pastor Slaybaugh. And uh, so it's exciting to be with you all. I think what I'll do is go ahead and sing. I'm going to make it a little easier on my wife. That way she can sit down. So uh, so I'll sing, and, and then we'll then we'll talk about Kenya. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but has given us the strength to obey. With power and sound mind, with love the unfailing kind, oh, be not ashamed of his way. May the Lord find us faithful. May his word be our banner held high. May the Lord find us faithful. Every day though we live, though we die. No man that seeketh after things of this life is a soldier who passes the test. Be faithful, be working, be running, be serving, be searching his word for his best. May the Lord find us faithful. May his word be our banner held high. May the Lord find us faithful every day, though we live, though we die. Living or dying, may honor be thine. From this wretched life you loved and forgave. A life that is on fire, the only our heart's desire, be faithful from now to the grave. May the Lord find us faithful, May his word be our banner held high. May the Lord find us faithful every day though we live, every day though we die, every day though we live, though we die. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, I was serving on staff at Grace Baptist Church in Hinesville, Georgia, uh, for about five and a half years, basically right after Rebecca and I got married. And uh, we had Deborah uh, before we went. And uh, I was there for about three years. And uh, the Lord really worked on my heart that I was not saved. Um, I made a profession of faith when I was four years old. Um, my parents had just gotten saved at that point, and uh, my sisters had gotten saved, and I knew that I needed to be saved, and I remember talking to my Sunday school teacher before Sunday school, telling her that I wanted to get saved. I remember talking to my parents after Sunday school was over and telling them that I had gotten saved, but I couldn't remember anything in between. And so I struggled with doubts uh, for as, really as long as I could remember. When I became a teenager, I just decided I wasn't going to worry about it anymore. Either I was saved or I wasn't, and I just wasn't going to worry about it. Uh, but uh, the Lord worked in my heart when I was 15 or 16 years old about going into full-time ministry, and that's not really what I wanted to do. Um, I played the piano, um, and uh, that was really everything to me. And that's what I wanted a career in, some way, shape, or form, uh, in music and 
so I wasn't really open to that, and so I struggled with that for about a year, and I finally surrendered, uh, but I didn't know exactly what it was that God had for me, and uh, so I went and I trained for the ministry at Ambassador Baptist College in Shelby, North Carolina, and while I was there, the Lord once again began working on my heart that I needed to be saved, uh, but I just kept putting it off and putting it off, and uh, Rebecca and I were married uh, after sh I finished college. She graduated from Bob Jones University. As soon as she was finished, we, we got married. And uh, so then I went on staff at, at Grace Baptist Church as youth director, and the Lord once again began working on my heart uh, very heavily. And it had been about two weeks. Uh, I wasn't sleeping real well. Basically, everything I was doing uh, while I was up uh, in the daytime, I was just thinking about where I would go if I were to die. And uh, so we were sitting in church on a Sunday morning. We had an evangelist preaching. And at the very end of the service, he said, if you're 100% sure, no doubt you all have heard this question many times, if you're 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven, raise your hand. And I had always been able to raise my hand before. I'd always been able to make myself raise my hand, even if it wasn't true. And uh, that morning, I could not. The Holy Spirit was just working on my heart uh, so heavily. I knew I had to get saved. And Rebecca noticed I didn't raise my hand. She looked and said, are you okay? And I said, we need to talk. And so we went to my office. And uh, she was, of course, shocked that I was struggling with this um, because I hadn't told her. And uh, we talked for a little while, didn't really get anywhere because I was just really struggling with the fact that if I got saved today, I have all these teenagers who are looking up to me, uh, all these people at church, I'm on staff, you know, what are they going to think? Uh, they find out, you know, that I really wasn't saved all this time. And uh, so I was struggling with that, and I talked to my pastor shortly thereafter that afternoon, and he said, Brother Matthew, you need to get nailed down today. Either what happened when you were four years old is the day that you got saved, or you need to get assurance of your salvation today. And I knew that I could not from the time that I was four, and so there in his office, I asked the Lord Jesus to forgive me of my sins and to give me a home in heaven, and I've never doubted my salvation since. Uh, but that's really kind of where this, I, this journey to Kenya started uh, because I began to pray after that day very specifically that the Lord would show me where he wanted me for the rest of my life. And uh, whether it was to stay in Hinesville, Georgia uh, as youth director, stay on staff there at Grace, or if it was something else. And I really just didn't know, and I wanted him to show me. And uh, so my wife and I began to pray together that God would lead us and guide us, and we determined that we'd just stay faithful right where we were until we knew what the Lord had. And uh, it was a couple years later, January of 2016, my pastor gave me a book to read about a missionary in Eastern Europe right before World War II. And through that book, God began stirring my heart about uh, foreign missions. And uh, the same month, I had just finished the book, and I was taking our uh, teenagers on an outing, and I looked up directions uh, in my smartphone. If any of you have those, I'm sure most of you do. And I put in directions to our activity, and Google Maps zoomed in on Kenya. And uh, it was really random at first, and it was like, that, that can't be, uh, why is it doing this, you know? But at the same time, I knew that this is what God had for us. And uh, so I know you can't go to Kenya because your phone messes up, and I knew that. Um, but at the same time, I just, I knew that's where we were going to be. And um, so it, it stuck with me. I couldn't get rid of this thought that this is where God wants us to go for several weeks. And I finally talked to my wife about it. And, of course, she had been to Mexico, spoke Spanish pretty well. She said, you're sure it's not South America somewhere? Because uh, I don't speak Spanish in Kenya. Um, but uh, I said, no, it's Kenya. And uh, we began to pray together that God would show us something concrete, that this is indeed his will for our lives. And uh, he did something in our lives that was completely unexpected, um, some things at our church that had changed and things, and we just knew it was time uh, for something different. And... Um, so that was an answer to prayer, but he also led us through the scriptures, Proverbs 16, 9. Uh, he led me to it first. He led her to it secondly, and then we were talking later. Did you see this verse? We did. And uh, Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. And so we could just see how God was shaping our desires all along to be involved in foreign missions and now how he was directing our steps to Kenya. And so we took a survey trip in July of 2016, and so... Uh, we put uh, a video together of some things that we saw in Kenya and uh, the need there that's in Kenya and also what God has called us to do. And so uh, we'll go ahead and show the video now if you all are ready. And uh, then afterwards we'll come up and say a few more things. Mm -hmm. 
Kenya is a land of diversity. This small country on the east coast of Africa hosts a variety of landscapes and an exotic array of wildlife. The people of Kenya are equally diverse. The 46 million people populating Kenya are made up of about 40 different tribal groups. It is also home to several Arabs, Indians, and Europeans. Living conditions range from rural to urban and severe poverty to western affluence. Each tribe has its own mother tongue, but Swahili is the main trade language of Kenya. In keeping with the variety of the country, Kenyans also hold many different spiritual beliefs. Every tribe within Kenya possesses its own traditional religion of animism, ancestral worship, and witchcraft. But due to heavy missionary presence and British influence in the early 1900s, 87% of Kenyans now claim to be Christian. This percentage gives a false hope, however, because it includes many Catholics, Anglicans, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and all other kinds of Protestant and Charismatic churches. There are also a great number of Kenyans who try to mix Christianity with elements of their traditional tribal religion. Islam is the second largest religion in Kenya, and there is a mosque in almost every town. Kenyans live in the shadows of confusion and fear. Satan has blinded the minds of those who are lost through false religions and false doctrines. There are too few independent Baptist churches preaching the gospel and discipling God's people. Kenyans live in fear of death. Due to AIDS, poor water quality, and lack of good medical care, 41% of the population is under the age of 14. Sporadic terrorism and ethnic violence add to daily concerns and uncertainties. The people of Kenya desperately need the hope that only comes through salvation in Jesus Christ. We are the Rose family, Matthew, Rebecca, Deborah, Anna, Esther, and Lydia. God has called us to Kenya to shine the light of his glorious gospel into the shadows. We are sent out by Grace Baptist Church in Hinesville, Georgia, and Worldwide New Testament Baptist Missions is our mission agency. I grew up in a Christian home and made a profession of faith when I was four years old, but struggled with doubts about my salvation until one Sunday morning when I was 27. I finally trusted Christ as my Savior. I immediately followed the Lord in believer's baptism that evening. During my teen years, God placed the call upon my life to be a preacher of the gospel. I surrendered to his call a year later and trained for the ministry at Ambassador Baptist College. Rebecca accepted Jesus as her Savior at her home when she was six years old. She followed in believer's baptism a few years later at the age of 11. As a teenager, God convicted Rebecca of her need to let him control her life, and she surrendered to his service when she was 16. God grew Rebecca's love for missions and allowed her to spend time in Mexico, working with Bearing Precious Seed in El Paso, Texas. She studied church music at Bob Jones University. After graduating college, we were married in September of 2010, and in 2011, God opened the door for me to serve on staff as youth director at our sending church. After serving faithfully in this capacity for five years, God has made it clear that he has something more for us to do. I have always enjoyed missionary stories, and I even had a personal desire to serve the Lord as a missionary but I never felt that God was actually calling me to the mission field. Then in January of 2016, God began working in my heart about serving him in the country of Kenya. Rebecca and I began to pray for God to clearly show us that Kenya was his will for our lives. He answered our prayer through the scriptures. We were both independently led to Proverbs 16:9, which says, A man's heart deviseth his way but the Lord directed his steps. We can see how God has sovereignly shaped our desire to be involved in missions, and how he has unmistakably directed our steps toward Kenya. Rebecca and I took a survey trip to Kenya in July of 2016. While we were there, the Lord blessed me with the opportunity to lead three Kenyan men to Jesus Christ, Samuel, Peter, and Lewis. But there are still many more who need Jesus as their Savior. Our desire is to reach Kenya with the gospel 
through church planting and training national men to reach their own people. Our ministry goals are evangelizing the lost, discipling the saved, planting indigenous churches, and training faithful men. There are so many Kenyans who still live in the shadows. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Kenyans are open to the gospel, but someone must tell them. If not, they will remain in the shadows. We must go because God has called us to go. Will you pray for us? Pray that God will go before us and prepare the hearts of the people we will minister to. Will you pray for Kenya? Pray that God would remove the spiritual blindness from their eyes. Help me with the lost and see them in their need. Help me with the lost. Salvation's cause to Okay, I just wanted to say a couple things about the video before we get into the Word of God a little bit tonight. Uh, we said there that Satan blinds the, the hearts and minds of those that are lost. The Bible teaches us that very clearly. And in Kenya, he uses a lot of confusion about uh, religion, specifically, if we want to call it that. Um, there's 40 different tribes in Kenya, and each tribe has their own traditional religion, and it's very hard for them to let go of that. There's been a lot of missionary influence in Kenya since the early 1900s. And uh, so a lot of Kenyans will claim that they're Christians. They'll, if you ask them, they'll say that I'm a Christian. Uh, but if you dig a little deeper into that, they know some terminology. Uh, Roman Catholicism is very big. Uh, basically, any denomination that you can think of uh, has a presence in Kenya. You see a lot of Catholicism, a lot of Seventh-day Adventism, uh, things like that. And uh, so what Kenyans often do is they'll try to keep some of their tribal religion and mix it with some form of Christianity. And uh, we know that it's not how you're saved. We're saved by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and that alone. Nothing that we can do, no traditions that we have, nothing uh, of our own merit. It's all through Jesus Christ and not of us. And so uh, we had the opportunity when we were there for a couple of weeks to lead three Kenyan men to the Lord. Nothing that we did uh, was all the Lord. Uh, we spent time with some veteran missionaries over there, and they, gave, and they let us partake in some of their ministry. And uh, one of the young men that we were out door knocking, and uh, he spoke English, so I was able to talk with him. Uh, he was a, a teenager, and he went to a Christian high school, what they call Christian, and uh, he said that he was a Christian. But as I began to talk to them, I realized he'd never been born again. He had never even heard that he needed to be born again. And uh, I shared John chapter 3 with him, where Jesus said he must be born again. It's not religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, he understood the gospel. I truly believe that. And he bowed his head, and he asked Jesus Christ to save him that day. He came to church the very next day, which was a Sunday. Another opportunity we had uh, was with the Shelby family. They're with BIMI, and they're in uh, western Kenya. And uh, they let us preach in their church on Sunday morning, and then Sunday afternoon they said there's a village uh, about an hour away who they've, a man and his wife are saved, and they've contacted us about coming to start a Bible study. And uh, so we went with them and had the opportunity to meet this family. As they were talking, uh, with them we couldn't understand what they were saying because we didn't know the language but they were talking we just assumed they were talking about a bible study uh, pretty soon their two sons came in and they were about 40 years old uh, one came in then a few minutes later another one came in and then they started talking and we really didn't know what they were talking about we were trying to look intelligent you know and um, 
pretty soon the missionary turned to me, and we had a couple translators with us too, and um, the missionary turned to me and said, these two men uh, want to get saved today. They want to get saved right now. Would you please open your Bible? And the translator will take it from English and put it into their language for them, their tribal language. And uh, so I had the privilege of going uh, from my Bible in the book of Romans to the Romans Road uh, with those two men, and they both asked Jesus Christ to save them that day. Um, since then, we've, just, we've heard from the missionary several times, and it's just kind of been a progression. 20 people got saved, 20 more people got saved, and then uh, the Bible study was just growing to the point they started a church, um, and they've gone back for uh, several times to do uh, like a week-long evangelism type thing and seeing more people get saved just in that one area. And so there's a real hunger and a real desire uh, for people in Kenya to know the truth. And uh, so that's encouraging to us. And uh, everywhere you go in Kenya, because there's so many people, um, you just see people. And uh, one of the things that we noticed when we were there is there wasn't a whole lot of independent Baptist churches. There's definitely some. And uh, even since we've come back from our survey trip, we've heard of um, some different uh, independent Baptist ministries that are over there starting churches and things. We've met some national men as well. Uh, but there's just so many people. And God has burdened us that they need more churches. And so our desire is to plant churches to train national men, uh, to see them take over that church as a pastor, and see those same churches, as many as the Lord would allow us to start, uh, to turn around and plant churches themselves, um, and involved in training other men who will be faithful to do likewise. And uh, so that's the burden that the Lord's placed on our heart, and we've been on deputation since January of this year, and we are praying that God would allow us to finish by January of 2019. And every church that we've been in, we've asked them to join us in prayer, uh, that we could do that, that the Lord would see fit to allow us to be done in January of 19. His timing is best, we know that, but that's what we're praying for, and so we'll ask you to pray with us towards that end as well. All right, if you would please take your Bibles tonight and go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. As we're here on the theme of missions this week, uh, no doubt we've already been challenged and encouraged at some point, that the world's population has really exploded. Uh, the point, we have seven and a half billion people in the world today. Seven and a half billion people. And I was just reading uh, a book earlier today, and I saw the statistic that potentially half of the world's population has never even heard the gospel of Jesus Christ before. 50%. That would be 3.75 billion people. People have never even heard the gospel, if that statistic is true. And so when we think about that, um, we know that Jesus Christ has commissioned us to preach the gospel to every creature. Not everyone will go to Kenya. And uh, all the missionaries here this week, wherever their field may be, whatever their ministry may be, uh, they may be the only people in this room called to that specific area, but God has a place for every single one of us in missions, whether it's here, whether it's abroad. And so tonight, we just want to look at the call of God for just a few minutes together. And there's no better example that I find in the scripture to me uh, put so clearly than in Jeremiah chapter 1 when God calls Jeremiah. So look at verse 4 of Jeremiah chapter 1. It says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And so Jeremiah here uh, doesn't know what God has for him. And then all of a sudden God comes and says, I've got a job for you. I have a calling for you, Jeremiah, and you're going to be a prophet to the nation, specifically the nation of Judah. He's a young man here at this time, but yet God has a calling for him. And God has a calling for every single one of his children. Every person in the room tonight who is saved, born again, God has a calling for you. Maybe you know what it is. Maybe you're like me until a couple years ago, I was just praying, Lord, what would you have me to do? Uh, sometimes we have to wait. Jeremiah didn't know what his calling was before God showed it to him. 
At some point, God came and said, this is what I want you to do. Just because you don't know doesn't mean that God doesn't have one for you. God has a calling for all of us. It was a customized calling. Look at verse 5 again. It says, before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Uh, God doesn't make us by mistake. And uh, before God ever made you, he knew what he would want you to do. He had a purpose. And he made you for that purpose, just like he made Jeremiah for this purpose. And so we can be confident God loves us and God wants to use us. It doesn't matter uh, what we've done. God is greater than all of that. And he knows what he wants you to do. He knows what he wants me to do. And he calls us. We can be confident that in God's time, in God's way, he'll show us what that calling is. But while we wait on the Lord, maybe some in the room don't know what it is that God has for you yet. Lord, would you have me go to the mission field? I don't know. Uh, Lord, would you have me to stay right here uh, where I live now and work uh, with this church and reaching the lost that are around us? What should we do while we wait for God to show us what it is that he has for us to do if we don't know already? I think of a young man named Samuel. Hannah prayed, she was barren, and said, Lord, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you all the days of his life. And God answered her prayer. She, he gave her a son, and as soon as she was weaned, she gave him back. He went to serve in the temple. And several times in 1 Samuel, we read this. 1 Samuel 2, verse 11 says, And the child, speaking of Samuel, did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. 1 Samuel 2.18, it says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child. And in 1 Samuel 3, we find again that Samuel ministered before the Lord. And in 1 Samuel 3, we find where God comes to Samuel and begins to call him in the middle of the night. Do you remember the story? And he says, Samuel, Samuel, and he goes to Eli, but Eli says, I didn't call you. And he goes, go lay back down. God calls again. He goes to Eli, I didn't call you. Go lay back down. And the third time, finally, Eli got it and said, the Lord's calling you. And so God calls again. And Samuel said, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. The Bible says that at that time there was no open vision in Israel. But God was fixing to change that. Samuel, God made Samuel his prophet. God made Samuel his man. God had a calling for Samuel. And he revealed it to Samuel as Samuel was serving the Lord faithfully. Maybe you're in the room tonight and you don't know what it is that God has for you to do. Just stay faithful. Serve the Lord. Do the things that you know you should be doing. Uh, when we speak of the call of God, we're speaking of something very specific that God has for you. But we can't forget about what I call the general will of God. Going to church, reading our Bible, praying, being a witness, uh, giving all those things that God commands us in his word. Any commandment we find in the word of God, any principle that's clearly uh, delineated in the word of God, we know we're to obey. And if we're not doing those things, then how can God speak to us? How can God show us what it is that he has for us to do? This calling was not by man. Jeremiah didn't create this calling. And uh, you and I are the same way. Uh, we can't just think, maybe God would have me to do that and go do it. We were counseled by so many people uh, in determining God's will, if Kenya was what he'd have for us, that you don't go unless you're certain of God's will for your life. What if you get to Kenya, they said, and you don't know, and hard times come up, what happens then? And so I uh, challenge you and encourage you, know what the Lord's will is for your life before you delve into it. It was not by man, it was by God, and it was unchanging. Jeremiah later, if we were to go to Jeremiah chapter 20, he stopped preaching. He faced some difficult things in his life because he was doing what God wanted him to do. And he said, that's it. I'm not going to preach anymore. But he said the word of God was like a fire shut up in his bones and he could not stay. And so he went back to doing what God called him to do. If you, you're in the room tonight and you know what it is the Lord has called you to do, maybe he's calling you to a foreign field somewhere. Maybe he's calling you into full-time mission work. And, uh, and you put that off, and you put that off, and you put that off. Maybe it'll just go away if I just ignore God. It won't. Uh, his calling doesn't change. Jeremiah could have ignored the Lord here. Remember Jonah, he did. 
uh, but it didn't change. But Jeremiah obeyed, and, and let us obey the Lord as well. Look at verse 6, if you would please, of Jeremiah chapter 1. We'll continue reading here. We're going to look at Jeremiah's excuse. We've seen the call of God, and then we're going to see Jeremiah's excuse. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. So his first excuse is, God, I can't speak. Now that's probably a legitimate excuse. Most people in the room, if we were to take a poll, show of hands, whatever you want to call it, and say, are you comfortable 100% getting up in front of a bunch of people like this and just talking? Most people would say no, and that's me, by the way, okay? Um, so it's okay, you're in good company. Um, but God knew that already about Jeremiah, and God called Jeremiah to do just that. And we see, uh, look here, the second excuse. I am a child. He was a young man. But how many young men in the Bible did God call? We have lots of young people in the room tonight. Uh, if you're 10 years old and God calls you to the mission field, that's okay. Does it mean you're going tomorrow? No. But it means he's placed his call in your life, and that's okay. Uh, Joseph was 17 years old when God called him into Egypt. He didn't understand why. He went through lots of difficult things, and it was many years before he knew why. Jeremiah was a young man here, but it didn't make a difference. God was calling him. And Moses, by the way, was 80 years old. And so sometimes older people tend to think that, well, you know, I'm kind of up there in years. God doesn't want to use me. His, you know, the good days are past, and we, we're just going to sit back and relax. But uh, God can call you when you're old, too. So don't check out. Uh, Moses didn't. He struggled. He used the same excuse. God, I can't speak. And God said, who made man's mouth? God knows all of our weaknesses. And we see from these two weaknesses, they're legitimate. And if we be honest, we could always say, there's always an excuse why we can't do what God wants us to do. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Uh, sometimes God's calling on our life exploits our greatest weaknesses. And why is that? It's because it's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. Uh, we can't do anything for the Lord apart from his help. When uh, Jesus told his disciples in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, the next few verses say that they went forth everywhere. And then it says the Lord working with them. God doesn't leave us when he calls us. Continue reading here, verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. The Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And so very quickly here, we see God's promise of enabling. The calling of God, the excuse of Jeremiah, and the promise of enabling. God said those excuses that you think you can't do what God's called you to do, I'm the answer for those excuses. Paul said it this way when he told about his thorn in the flesh. God answered his prayer and said, my grace is sufficient for thee. God wasn't going to take those problems that the Apostle Paul had in the way. He wasn't going to take them away, but he was going to be enough to meet the need. And those excuses that we have, maybe they're legitimate, maybe they're real, but God's enough to meet those things. He already knows those things about us. He said, I'm going to put my words in your mouth. And I'm giving you my authority to go. So no matter if you can speak or not, Jeremiah, it doesn't matter because I'm speaking. And whether you're young or not, it doesn't matter because you have my authority. And so we can mark it down that even though we may have a great weakness, that God is enough to meet that weakness. He can take our greatest weakness and make it into our greatest strength, not because it's our strength, but because it's his strength. And so uh, as we go into the week, I just challenge you, if you don't know what it is the Lord has for you, pray, Lord, what do you have for me? Whether you show it to me this week, whether you show it to me next week, next year, whenever it is, Lord, I want to know what your will is for my life. And when you show me, I'm ready to do it and stay faithful. And if you already know what God has for you to do and you're hesitating because you have some excuse in your life, uh, don't let that stop you. Uh, God can meet that need. Brother Slayball. Thou callest, I gladly obey. Only 
direct me and I'll find thy way. Teach me the mission appointed for me. What is my labor and where it shall be? Master, thou callest and this I reply. Ready and willing, Lord, here am I. Willing, my Savior, to take up the cross. Willing to suffer reproaches and loss. Willing to follow if thou wilt but lead. Only support me with grace in my need. Master, the call is and this I turn from the right pity and bring me again to the right master the call is and this I reply ready and willing Lord dear am I It's a joy to be here again, and I have already enjoyed the conference up till now. It's been a blessing. Appreciate uh, Brother Rose's uh, message, and and then uh, the wonderful music. Um, man, I'll tell you, it just doesn't seem right. You know, I I, I mess up when I try to even play the radio, and uh, so it's a it's a blessing. I, I'm glad the Lord calls some people with talent. Amen. And then He calls others like your pastor and me. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's always a joy to be here. I, I love preaching here. I love your pastor and his family. And uh, I'm so glad to be able to have my wife with me on this trip. And, and uh, appreciate her being able to make the, the journey with me. And, and uh, many of you have prayed for my wife's health uh, for a number of years. And she is just doing so much better. And uh, we thank the Lord for that. And and i uh, been able to travel with me more, which means I have to behave more. And, uh, uh, but it's always a, a blessing to have her with me. I, I really, I know this is a missions conference, and I, I really am I'm, I'm burdened. I feel like I, I really need to, to preach a message of, of comfort to you, Ohio State fans. And, but but I'll, I'll stay with the theme. Uh, uh, but I, I always enjoy coming. Thank you, Pastor, for uh, your goodness to me. And this church helps support my wife and I. And uh, you just, uh, as a lot of folks don't understand as an evangelist, it's true. We get love offerings where we go and preach most of the time. And, uh, uh, but there's, there's times we have uh, where we're just month after month, just back to back, busy, busy. And then there's all of a sudden months that just kind of dry up and you pray and fast and say, Lord, don't forget me. And, uh, you know, it's during those times that, that uh, the schedule lightens up that it's so helpful uh, to have churches that, uh, that believe in your ministry and that help support you. And So thank you, church, for your faithful support to us. It's been uh, such a huge help and blessing to us, and uh, so I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to the next few nights together. I sure want to encourage you, don't miss one part of it. 
You know, any any time the Lord puts a a, a, a revival meeting or a, a missions conference together, and to me, there's not much difference. Um, but you just don't want to miss a part of it because it all fits together and one builds on another, and God will have something for us in every t- every time we meet. And uh, and I'm never in a missions conference that I don't feel feel called to every mission field. Amen. And and your heart just gets burdened, and you see uh, the incredible need. And it's overwhelming. And, uh, and, and so I, I'm excited about it. I believe a missions conference deals as much with the basics of the Christian life as anything we'll deal with. It challenges our priorities. It hits us in the pocketbook. It challenges us to, to how much we love money and things of the world and, and really where God's priorities fit in with us. It challenges our faith. Uh, it's just so much of a missions conference that deals with all of the basics of the Christian life. And I want you to open your Bibles with me tonight to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, in just a moment we'll begin reading in verse 16. If you've been saved for very long, these are not new verses to you. But I want you to understand, we come here to this, the last verses of the book of Matthew. But I want you to understand, this is not just the end. This is really the climax of the book of Matthew. You see, the whole book has been leading us to this point. The Lord Jesus has made an appointment with his followers to tell them something. At this point, he's already been crucified. He's been buried. And now he's risen again. And now they that are saved and redemption's price has been paid, what now? He's going to be ascending to the Father. So what now? They've seen his crucifixion. You see, this is crucial. What he's going to tell them at this time is absolutely essential. If you miss this, you will miss the purpose of Bible Baptist Church. You'll miss the purpose of why God ordained the local church. You see, many want to to be Uh, involved in church to the degree that it serves their intent or their personal need. And yet so few really care what the real purpose of the church is in the plan of God. Some people think, well, the church is for fellowship. You know, we have activity and wholesome family time. And and some think, well, the church is about worship and and music and we, we cultivate love and relationships and some think that the church is to just for teaching doctrine and practical Bible principles. and Others think that the church is where we come and just have praise and adoration of Him. And I want you to understand tonight, church, that all of the above are essential in the church, but none of them is the purpose or the objective of the church. Now, I understand our great motive as a Christian is to glorify Him. Ephesians 3.21 says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. But what is the mission that flows out of that motive to glorify him? It's not only revealed in our text tonight. It's actually revealed all through the scripture from the very beginning to the end. When Adam fell into sin, he had been known to walk with God in the cool of the day. It was not the next morning that Adam went looking for God. It was that God went looking for Adam. Where art thou, Adam? The first call was in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9, and the last call is in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. You see, God is glorified when sinners are saved, redeemed, reconciled to Him. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with me. We'll come back to our text. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And 
And verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself uh, by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. In Luke chapter 19, it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Way back in the book of Isaiah, God said to Israel in Isaiah 49 and verse 6, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that, that, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. I mean, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, God has always had the heartbeat to reach out to mankind who is lost without hope. It's always been his heart. In John 17, 18, it says, As thou hast sent me into the world, so have I also sent them into the world. Everything can be accomplished in heaven for the Christian except winning the loss to Christ. Everything else. So we want to ask ourselves tonight, if the main purpose for the church is to get the gospel to lost souls so they can be saved, then we need to ask ourselves individually as Christians, how involved are you in that process? You as an individual Christian, how involved are you in that process? Is this what you build your life around? Is this the priority for your time, your money, your energy, your effort, your talent? Is all focused on the purpose that the Lord established His church? Well, look with me in Matthew 28, verse 16. What he says now, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So hear the Lord now gives his purpose for the existence of his followers. He gathers his church together. He speaks to them and gives them their responsibility now. He's about to ascend into heaven. In fact, in, in, in Acts chapter 1 is really where it continues on. And if you'll notice in Acts chapter 1, look at verse 8. And the Lord says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall run around and speak in tongues and jump up and down. And... No, that's not what it says, is it? It says, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. For what? And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, the, the, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. You see, he began it. The Lord Jesus began it. But now, he's saying in the book of Acts, is the record of what, what his followers, his disciples, are carrying on. He began the work there to finish it, there to carry it on. That's our responsibility. That's what he tells us in Matthew 28, 16. You see, all of the Matthew 28 is not just the final few verses of the book. It's really the climax of the book. He's proven himself to be God. He's done miracle after miracle. He's risen from the dead at this point. Now he gathers those redeemed that are following him and says, Now I've got something you need to understand. I'm going to be ascending on into heaven. I began this work. Now you're to carry it on. The goal and the the purpose of his church is to get the gospel to every creature. Every creature. Now there's five essentials 
if you're to fulfill that purpose. And I want you to look at those with me real quick tonight. Number one, you got to be available. You got to be available. You see, verse 16 tells us that the 11 disciples went in, away into Galilee into a into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. See, they weren't just on a leisurely stroll that day. And the Lord, after his resurrection, decides to meet them. No, he had actually made an appointment with them. He had actually told them to come there. Look over at Matthew chapter 26. Verse 32 he said, but after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. So he told them, I'm about to be crucified. I'm going to raise again. I'm going to meet you in Galilee. Notice what it says in, Acts, or in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 7. Now the Lord has been buried. The ladies had come to the tomb. The angel appeared to them. In verse 6 it says, He is not here, for he's risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And, so, and, and go quickly and tell his disciples that uh, he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. So he told the ladies, now you need to run and you tell those, those disciples that the Lord is going to meet them in Galilee. Don't forget it. The Lord had told them that. Now the ladies come back from the tomb and they tell them, Lord wants to meet you in Galilee. This wasn't just some circumstance. The Lord had this place appointed to meet them. But I want to tell you something. They could have never gotten their commission had they not been willing and available to go. And I'm going to tell you, you as a church will never be what God wants you to be as a church unless you as individual members are available to fulfill his purpose. You've got to say, okay, Lord, if that's whatever you want, Lord. You've got to make yourself available. Our brother testified tonight already. It started out for him when he just said, Lord, what, what do you want? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? You have to be available. You know, I can remember... Back when I played football just a few years ago. <laughs> I was never one that wanted to stand on the sideline. I just, you know, I wasn't interested in just having a uniform so everybody would know that I made the team. I wanted to be in the middle of it. I mean, if there was a fight afterwards, I wanted to be in the middle of it. But if I was on the sideline, I guarantee you, you would find me standing right next to the coach saying, Coach, I'm ready. You need somebody? You know, that ought to be the way in the Christian life. I mean, it ought to be the worst of so, Lord, look what you've done for me. God, what do you want from me? What, what can I do? What is it that, that, that you want me to do? Lord, how can I be used for thee? It's the purpose of the church, but you've got to be available. I'm so thankful that many years ago, out in the country in Michigan, there was a little lady there that noticed the neighbors had, had, some new neighbors had moved in. And she was up in years, and, and she wasn't able to be involved in everything that she at one time was in her church, but she still ha had a heart and wanted to be used of the Lord, and she still wanted to reach who she could for the Lord. And she knows those new neighbors, and she brought them some cookies, and she invited their little boy to ride in her car to go to the Baptist church down the road there in the country. The little boy didn't want to go, but they, mom said, yeah, you're going. The little boy went, and the next, next week she come by again with some cookies and invited him again, and he didn't want to go, but the mother said he'll be ready. That little boy ended up getting saved in Sunday school. And that little boy grew up, but he got away from the Lord during his teenage years running around with some wrong kids and ended up in the Navy. While he was in the Navy, he was overseas, and God kept dealing with his heart because he was saved. And overseas, he yielded his heart to whatever the Lord wanted. And he felt like God wanted him to go in the ministry. So he came back, and then he got out of the Navy. He went to Bible college. And when he graduated a little country uh, church, 
in Michigan, seven miles from any town, any, uh, seven miles from any dirt roads, out in the middle of the cornfields, called and asked him to be their pastor. He came there and got stirred up to, to preach the gospel, win souls for Christ, got burdened about winning people throughout that little country area, and man, they, they started seeing people saved right and left, and a couple of boys got saved, they're old drug heads, and they got cranked up and started inviting people, and, and pretty soon they invited a couple teenage girls to come to church, and one of those teenage girls was my wife. When he, when he preached the gospel and she got saved at 16 years of age, can I tell you something? It all went back to a little lady who was older and didn't have a whole lot left, but she knew she could maybe reach some boy, boy, boys and girls in the neighborhood there. We can't forget the purpose. That's why we're here, but we all have to be available. As our brother said, we can all have a thousand excuses. But they really don't stand up much when we look at Calvary and see the blood that was shed for you and I. As wretched as we are that God would love us that much. But it's got to start out with you being available. Available to go where you can go. Available to give to send those who will go where you won't be able to go. That's our purpose that's what we're here for. S.B. Gordon was a, a writer and he wrote in one of his books he told about a group that was preparing to climb the Mount Blanc in the Swiss Alps. The group had gathered together and they could see the trail that people had followed to climb up to the peak. And The guide, when he got them together, he said, now listen, I, I know you can see the way, but you, you just need to follow these, these rules. It's very essential. It's a lot harder than it looks. Well, there's one young cocky guy in the group, and, you know, he figured he could handle it, you know. And the guy said, well, you, you know, listen to me. Don't take anything more than what you have to have. You need to discard any extra cameras. You need to discard any extra blankets. You need to discard any extra snacks. You know, you just need to take the bare essentials. Because it's a tough road up there. Well, that young guy, he thought, ah, I can see how to go. I can see the trail. I really don't need this guy. I'm going to go and do it my own way. And so he started off. The race rest stayed and listened to the guide, and they waited for him. And, and so they followed his rules, and they, they started up the trail. As they were going up that trail up to the peak, they noticed there was, after a while, there was a blanket that was discarded. And after a little while longer, they noticed some snacks were laying along the side of the trail. And then they noticed there was a camera that laying aside. And you know, they got to the peak and that young man had made it. But he found along the way, he had to let go of all the non-essentials. And I'm going to tell you what we're plagued with today in independent fundamental Baptist churches. We're plagued with a bunch of folks who want to go to the mountaintop, they just want to take all their toys with them. And we've got people in Kenya, we've got people in New Guinea, we've got people in Germany, we've got people all over this world that need the gospel. Our brother said at least 50% have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Doesn't that do something to you? Here we are, Americans. God's been so good to us. We're saved. Somebody cared enough to give us the gospel. Somehow we got saved. We live in a country where we've got Bibles everywhere. And we're so wrapped up, we'd rather buy a fishing boat than send somebody to Kenya. And we wonder why we're not seeing revival. We we'll wonder, listen folks, we've got to get out of ourselves and realize God didn't save us here so that we could make comfort our God. He saved and left us here to fulfill a purpose. And that's what he gathered his disciples together before he ascended. He said, this is what you're to do. You've got to get the gospel out to every creature. I read a statistic, I don't know if it's accurate or not, I just read the statistic, it said 
from the time of our Savior until, until today of the entire population that's ever walked this earth, there's been less than 60% that has ever he heard a clear presentation of the gospel. We have failed. And we've got to get back to the purpose. It starts with being available. Would you pray this week, church member, would you pray and say, Dear God, has this been my heartbeat? Can I tell you something? You don't have to be an evangelist to have that heartbeat. You don't have to be a pastor or a missionary. All you have to be is a Christian that loves Jesus. That's available. Say, okay, Lord. Am I, am I as involved as you want me to be in winning souls to Christ in my area? Am I as involved as you want me to be in giving to missions to send folks to go where I won't be able to go? Availability, then adoration. Notice in verse 17 of Matthew 28. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. And some doubted. Adoration. Isn't it amazing? Everything in the Christian life all comes back really to the motive of that first commandment. To love him with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength. To adore him. That's the motive. To please him. My wife said to me, I don't know if it was today or yesterday. When we were together, she said, you know, isn't it something that God would reach into my home when I wasn't even looking for Him at 16 and save me and give me the opportunity to be involved in the ministry all these years? That's something. Aren't you amazed what God did for you? I mean, folks, come on, let's take off our Baptist halos. Why would God look at somebody as wretched and wicked as my heart is and reach down and save me? Doesn't that cause you to say, Dear Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to please you, Lord. I want to do whatever it takes, Lord. I don't want to do it my way. I want to do it your way. You see, it throws out all the compromise. It throws out all the way, well, I don't want to do it that I don't care what the preacher says. I want to do it this way. It doesn't matter. All that goes out the window when you just fall in love with him and you say, Lord, I want it to be what you want. Nothing else matters. You see, the truth is, missions is something that's to come out of a local church. It's to be, it's to be sent from a local church. That's God's plan. It's what he did from the beginning. We got a lot of folks get, well, you know, man, I saw this on the TV and that little guy was there and his stomach was all swollen out. And man, I just reached in my pocket. Hey, listen, that does move your heart. But I want to tell you the problem is there's a whole lot of Christian people in America that are sending their money to a lot of people that are taking food over to foreign countries and giving people food but never telling them the gospel. And what good have we done if we fed some hungry people and let them die and go to hell without the gospel? And that's why God sends it through His local church because you've got a pastor that's going to make sure that missionaries are preaching the right doctrine and it's, and it's going to the right place. Adoration. Then notice in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Acknowledge me. He acknowledged that he has all authority. And that's something. Can you imagine how the, the, these disciples felt? They had left all to follow him. They, they sought the crucifixion, the horror of it. They put him in that tomb. They were discouraged. What now? The ladies come and remind him, hey, remember? The Lord said he wanted to meet you in Galilee after, after he was risen again. Hey, he's risen again. We're just at the tomb. The angel told us to remind you. He wants to meet you in Galilee. Can you imagine as they went to Galilee? Can you imagine the anticipation? Excitement in their heart, man. What's he going to say? What's he going to tell us? They all gather together. They're sitting there listening intently. Not like some of you right now. 
They're listening intently, wonder what is he gonna what, what's this meaning all about? And here's what he says. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Wow. You know what he was saying? I have proven myself to you that I'm God. You've seen the miracles. You've heard the truths from heaven. Now you've seen that I've conquered death. I rose from the dead. Now understand, I'm God. I have all power. I have every right to instruct you and tell you what you ought to do with your life. That's what he's saying. Can I tell you something, Baptist? He does have every right. He saved you. He's got every right to tell you how to live. He's got every right to tell you how to talk. He's got every right to tell you how to dress. He's got every right to tell you what kind of music you ought to listen to. He has every right to tell you everything you ought to do with your life. Hogwash with all this modern junk that's going around. Well, it doesn't matter how you live. doesn't matter how you talk. doesn't matter how you dress. Sure, it matters. We're here for His purpose. We're not here for our purpose. We're here for His purpose. Acknowledgement. He's got every right to lead me and guide me where He wants me. I never knew this until just a few weeks ago. We have a son that pastors in Clinton, Iowa. And I've had the joy twice this year, uh, first time, but twice this year I've had the joy to preach at a youth conference with my son. And that's been a joy. I never, I never knew this. He was preaching to teenagers and he shared with them. When I was in Bible college, he said we had a missions conference. He said, I went forward, I wept like a baby, and I said, dear God, I'm surrendering to the mission field. I never knew that. He said God's will wasn't for me to go to the mission field, but God knew I needed to surrender to it. And that's absolutely true. And every one of us ought to surrender to it. Every one of us ought to say, Lord, whatever you want. Do you want me to the mission field? Good. You want me to teach Sunday school here at Grace or at uh, Bible Baptist? Great. Lord, if you, if you want me to, uh, to, to, to be here to win my neighbors to Christ, and wonderful. Lord, if you want me to go to Portugal, Lord, that's fine. Really, He's the Master. We're just the servants. Acknowledge His power, His authority. And so what's He going to tell them? Now that He has all the authority, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do? I want you to get the gospel to every creature. That's His command. It's the purpose of the church. I ask you again, church member, so how involved are you in that purpose? Personally in the area, financially in giving to support missions that go, missionaries that go. Well, notice number four in verse 19, action. So it says, go ye therefore. Got to get up and go. Got to have action. So what are we doing to fulfill that go commandment? We're to go, see converts baptized, teach them how to be effective in winning others to Christ so that they can see folks come and get saved and baptized and teach them. It says to all nations. The Apostle Paul got saved on the Damascus Road that day. The first thing he said is, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, willing to save me? What do you have me to do? It would be more surprising than not for somebody in this church to not be called to a mission field. Most likely there's some young people here that the Lord's looking and saying, I want your life to count. I want you to be like one of these missionaries who just say, okay, Lord. It's not that just somebody has to go, but the Lord has selected some specifically to go. And some of you need to say as a young person, forget about, oh, you know, man, where can I make the most money? How can I be the most impressive? Forget about all that joke. You think that's going to matter when you stand before the Lord? 
If God calls you to be a businessman, be a businessman that uses his money to send missionaries. Be a businessman that wins souls everywhere you go. That's just fine if that's God's will for you, but just surrender. Say whatever you want, Lord. Action it means we've got to do something. We've got to go. We've got to get involved. We've got to give. So we need to be available. It requires adoration. It requires acknowledgement. It requires action. And then notice the ability in verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Lord says, and just remember, you're not going by yourself. I'll go with you. It won't depend on you. It's not about all your ability. It's not about all your power. You see, His promise of His presence is a promise to lead you. A promise to provide for you. A promise to protect you. A promise to assist you. If He's going to be with you, He's not going to let you, you, you go with, without those needs met. We go in His power. We go so and we go in His power. You give, you give in His power. The missionary needs to go in, in God's power. I remember it's always been amazing to me through the years of, I grew up in church, I've been around preachers and missionaries, and it's just always been amazing to me to watch how God uses people. All kinds of different people. It's one of the most wonderful things. You know, if you just look at the apostles, man, they're all different. You know, the Apostle Paul, I mean, he was, he was a very intelligent guy. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, but Peter, he's just a fisherman. You know, Timothy was taught the Scriptures from when he was young, but Matthew, he, he was a cheating tax collector. They're just all different. But God used them because it wasn't about them. It was about His power and His ability. And there's not a one of us that couldn't win souls to Christ. Because it's about His ability. There's not a one of us that couldn't, couldn't uh, be the missionary wherever God wants us because it's about His ability. To my shame, I remember when I was pastoring years ago and there was a fellow that called and he'd sent his newsletter and sent a card and he called with a follow-up call and said, Pastor, we're going to be coming through your area. Would it be possible maybe we could show our slides and present our ministry? And and I said, that'll be fine, brother. You come ahead. And he came. And I, I remember when I met him. I met him and his wife. Now, I want to tell you, they weren't talented like the roses. In fact, when I met him, I thought, is that really your name or is your name Gomer Pyle? <laughs> I mean, to my shame, but I thought, dear Lord. They've got good hearts, you know, they're sweet people, but I don't know how they're going to make it. You know, I shouldn't think that way, but I'm just telling you I'm human. And I thought, you know, man, the guy's kind of dorky, and his wife's not too sharp, and, you know, he doesn't dress real good, and I'm thinking, preacher, how's he going to raise support? My heart went out to him. I mean, just a good-hearted people. But I'm thinking, man, how are they going to make it? Well, he did. They raised their support. They went to Africa. We supported them. I felt sorry for them. I started getting their newsletters. Pretty soon they're running 400 church. A couple years, I get in, again, I'm looking, I said, it can't be the same people. They had a high day of 1,000. The last newsletter I read, it's been a little while ago, but they had over 1,200. You know why? Because it's not about us. He'll go with you. It's His ability. It's His power. Not us being so slick and got it all figured out. It's a mighty, powerful God if we just obey Him and trust Him. That's true about just going so one and door to door in America. It's true about going to Kenya. Wherever God says, you're doing my work, I'll go with you. Hey, Bible Baptist Church, you got my priority as your priority, I'll be with you.
to every step of it. Many years ago on a very dangerous sea coast and there were ships that oftentimes would wreck and sink off of this sea coast that on the eastern seaboard and and so the somebody got concerned about it. They built a crude little hut along that sea coast and they had one little boat and a few guys that were concerned enough that said, Man, we have having too many wrecks out there, too many people losing their lives and so these guys would get together and when they would hear of a shipwreck they would they would take the boat out and they'd save as many as they could. Bring them back to shore. Word got out and people in the area thought, man, that's, that's really admirable and amazing. And so they said, hey, you know, why don't we, why don't we invest and get them a, another boat that's a little bit nicer and maybe we can hire a couple of crews and, and we could fix that hut up to make it a little more attractive and so they did. People invested. Some of the people that had been saved from the shipwrecks had decided to invest and they built a nicer little saving station there and some nicer boats and hired some people actually to go do some of the rescue work. And pretty soon it becomes such an attraction. And people were so amazed at what was being done that, you know, they just really made it a, a such a nice little place that they started having some of the, the gatherings from the community there for special occasions and, and it just kind of became a nice little meeting place and, and, and then you know when they, they had a big shipwreck and they brought in a number of folks and man when they came in they were, they were covered with seaweed and, and, and smell good and, and, and man they got in and, and folks got together and they said you know we've given a lot of money to make this little nice station here and you know, that they just kind of ruin it when they come in that way. Why don't we build a little separate uh, 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 shower place for them so they don't have to come in and mess up the nice place. And, and so they did. And it wasn't much longer than, than that, that that they got together one night and they decided, you know, let's, let's just have a little vote, you know, because we're, we're just really not so sure that we ought to keep this kind of thing up. We've invested a lot of money in this nice place. And, and so they took a vote and... And, and, and about split down the middle, but the, the half that, that wanted to close the life-saving business and just turn it into a nice little place of gathering and, you know, just, just more of a little social club, that group won the vote. So they got rid of the life-saving business. But that group that still wanted to see those people rescued, they moved down the coastline. They built another little sh shack of a place and they started over. Word got around, it wasn't long until the same thing happened. People started giving, they built a nice little place and got a new boat. And, and it wasn't very long until a group got in and said, hey, you know, it's kind of messing up the facilities here. Let's, let's stop all this life-saving stuff. So... That group that cared moved down and started another one. And now you can go all over that sea, sea coast, that coastline, and you'll find all of these little life-saving stations. And nobody's saving anybody's life anymore. And it's happening all over this country. You can go to Baptist churches all over. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. This guy's a Baptist by conviction. But I'm embarrassed by a lot of Baptist churches I see. Become just social clubs. We're happy if the bills are paid. No big fussing going on. Pastor doesn't stir up too many people in the message. We're okay with that. Doesn't matter if people are getting saved or not. Doesn't matter whether we got missionaries reporting that souls are being saved across the world. We've lost our purpose. In a missions conference is all about us coming back together and being reminded the same thing the Lord told them before He ascended. All power is given unto me. Here's what I want you to do. Go get the gospel to every, every creature. Every creature. It only happens as we go where we're at as we're willing to give to send those who will go where we won't go. Let's bow our heads for prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for the precious Word of God. Help us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, when we get so enamored with things that won't matter a hill of beans when we see you. Forgive us, Lord, when we don't even take opportunities to be involved in the soul winning ministries of our own churches. When, Lord, we would rather have things than invest in a missionary who's taken the most precious gift to be sent across the world to see souls saved. Would you help us, Lord? Would you help us to be honest with you tonight and allow you to evaluate our hearts and lives, Lord? Would you help us as your children tonight to really be honest as we answer that question, how involved are we in the real purpose that you have us here as a church? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed tonight. I want to ask if you'd say, Brother Booth, thank God, I, I'm so glad I'm saved. Brother Booth, I, I remember where I was when I was lost and I knew I was on my way to hell and deserved to go to hell and somebody took the Word of God and showed me from the Word of God how I could be saved and forgiven. And I sincerely called upon the Lord with a repentant heart and asked Him to save me and forgive me. And Brother Booth, if I died right this minute, I am 100% sure I'd go to heaven. I can take you to that place. I know that I'm saved and I'm thankful for it. If that's your honest testimony, would you indicate that by raising your hand? So raise it up and then put it down. Thank you. And I wonder tonight who would say, Brother Booth, I'm saved on my way to heaven, but God knows I needed the reminder tonight. Somewhere during the message, the Holy Ghost is dealing with me as a Christian. Maybe that you need to get going so when, and maybe you used to and you just got the priorities out of whack. Maybe you're giving, you haven't even prayed. And asked, dear God, what do you want me to give above and beyond my tithes to missions to get the gospel across the world? To be involved in the very purpose of having a church. You'd say, Brother Booth, somewhere during the message tonight, the Holy Spirit dealt with me as a Christian. I needed that. I need to get some things settled with the Lord. Pray for me. Would you slip your hands up, Christians? God spoke to your heart tonight. God bless you. Thank God for you. I wonder if there's somebody else, maybe something I didn't mention, but the Holy Spirit's dealing with you about. Brother Booth, include me in the prayer tonight. I didn't raise my hand, but, but I should have God's dealing with me. Maybe something I never preached about. The Lord's dealing with me. Include me in the prayer tonight. Some things I need to get settled with the Lord. Pray for me. Slip your hand up. Are there others? Several others. Glad we waited. God bless you. Is there anybody tonight who would say, to be honest with you, Brother Booth, if I died right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I heard a missionary's testimony that he made a decision when he was young, and yet he struggled all those years, not, not really sure he was saved. And maybe that spoke to you. Maybe that's you. Brother Booth, I, I'm just not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I, I've been wrestling with it. I have doubts. I, I just need to get it settled. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that tonight? Maybe there's some young person, maybe an older person. God's tugging at your heart about going and surrendering yourself to missions. And I want to just encourage you, if you just say yes, Lord, He'll direct you. He'll give your preacher wisdom to counsel you and help direct you. But nobody's ever been sorry they said yes to the Lord. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for the time we've had together tonight. Thank you for your faithful people to be out on a Thursday night. And Lord, we ask you that you'd, you would do a work through these next days. Lord, direct us. Give us clear leading. Maybe there's some, Lord, that need to surrender to missions. Maybe there's some that need to surrender to listen to your voice about giving to missions. Maybe some need to get busy about the matter of winning souls to Christ. So Lord, just do your work. You saw a number of hands raised tonight, Lord. I don't know what all those needs are, but you do. And I pray that you'd give victories, help us to humble ourselves and come to an old-fashioned altar and allow you to give us that grace we need. So do your mighty work now at this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. As the music plays, God spoke to your heart, you need to come, would you come right now? Let's not hesitate. The Lord dealing with your heart. Just come on. Our 
hands raised. I can't do any more than I did. I prayed for you. Now's your opportunity. Have you asked God yet what He wants you to do in giving to missions? I'm not talking about what you calculate with your budget. I'm asking if you ask God what He wants you to do. If I was to ask your pastor what part of the soul winning ministries are they involved in in your church, what would his report be? It's our purpose. It's why we're here. So easy to get distracted. if you will. Thank you, Brother Booth. Good start to this week, isn't it? And uh, looking forward to the next few nights, what the Lord has in store for us. Brother Fennel, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you going to uh, give us any stats about uh, how many unreached people there are and who's never heard the gospel, things like that? Is that part of your... Good, okay. And the people who don't have any word of God and things like that, great. Good. Don't miss tomorrow night. Uh, you want to you want to be in on that, and he's right. Brother was right. Every every night kind of just builds on the other night, and it's not that not that anybody talks to anybody. It's just the way God puts it together. It, it happens every single time, and uh, never fails. So excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. You know, uh, something I'm working on right now is uh, Colossians, where it says, "As ye have received Christ Jesus the Lord." How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? You received him by faith. How did you get saved? By faith. So how, as you received him, so walk ye in him. So you received him by faith. How were you supposed to live for him? By faith. Did you do, did, was it you who got yourself saved? No. Was it your effort? See? Was it, well, you didn't know it's him. Well, why is it your effort to live for him? Why is it your effort to walk with him? It's supposed to be him doing the work through us. And uh, that'll be something down the road. But that's thought about that tonight when he was talking about that. Uh, uh, a good, good message. Availability, adoration, acknowledgement, action, and ability. I actually had an alliterated outline. I was very impressed with Brother Bruce doing that. And uh, that's good, brother. Amen. Preach without your glasses more often. He told me I didn't have my glasses tonight. He says, I don't know what's going to come out tonight. So uh, he 
left his glasses there. So it worked good, didn't it? Uh, remember, those of you who are uh, getting the nightly gifts to the missionaries, make sure you take care of that after the, when we dismiss here tonight. Missionaries, I'm going to ask you, uh, as we sing the closing song, uh, if you wouldn't mind going down to the conference room to your table. And then, folks, as we dismiss, you go into the conference room and get a chance to chat with them and talk with them, look at their display, and uh, any get a prayer card from them, chat with them a little bit, get to know them a little bit, all right? You're going to spend the next four days together. You better know each other, all right? And uh, enjoy that. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's made their way here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for what you did here this evening. Thank you for the roses, and thank you, Lord, for the message tonight from Brother Booth. Lord, you, you spoke to our hearts tonight. We were glad to have been here this evening. We do pray, Lord, that you will help us to leave this place, Lord, and be doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us to realize there's folks who are lost all around us. Help us to be sensitive to the leading of your spirit, the divine appointments that you give to us. Lord, help us to give the gospel to someone even this evening yet. Amen. So, Lord, bless our fellowship time afterwards. Give us all a good night's rest. And, Lord, I pray if you tarry your coming, you'll bring us back for the service tomorrow night. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Let's sing that song we uh, sing for, our, for the conference on the back of your bulletin there. Let's do the first and the last stanza, okay? First and last stanza, take my life and let it be. Brother Bob, want to lead us? Take my life and let